This is Radio Equal Shock with your host, Alex Smith. Is climate change getting you down? Does it keep you up at night? Artists and academics are trying to express this new dis-ease. And mental health professionals are starting to see a new kind of climate trauma, too. Judith Deutsch is a psychoanalyst with a private practice in Toronto, Canada. Raised and educated in California, Judy has been on the faculty of the Toronto Psychoanalytic Institute. She is a wide-ranging voice for social conscience as past president of Science for Peace, a member of Independent Jewish Voices Canada, respected columnist for Canadian Dimension magazine, and contributor to Counterpunch. Judy Deutsch, thank you for joining us on Radio EcoShock. Thank you very much for inviting me. I feel very honored. It's great to talk to you. We talked a little bit in email, and you've inspired me several times with your comments, so that's why we're here. Many of the scientists that I've talked to have expressed their personal worries and loss concerning the climate science that they've published. And I'm wondering, have you heard about stress in the scientific community about climate change? That's a somewhat complex question. I guess my reading, uh, you know, and talking with people in, in many different groups and, and uh, you know, my clinical experience and so on, is that, again, is that there's a tremendous variability. And I think that there's many problems in terms of trying to figure out how people are responding to climate change. So it's represented in so many different ways, and people have many different kinds of experiences with it. It is complex. Uh, I know that there's only been very few real hard data attempts to study this. A lot of what we know is just what people tell us or write about, but uh, there was one called Empirical Evidence of Mental Health Risks Posed by Climate Change. It was published in October 2018 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And what they did, they got 2 million randomly sampled U.S. residents across a decade of data collection, they say, and they concluded that environmental stressors produced by climate change pose threats to human mental health. Well, you know, for me, Judy, that doesn't tell me much beyond the obvious. What are your feelings about that sort of scientific approach to this? Uh, well, I think it's very flawed. You know, um, questionnaires without having much information about people, you know, the individual people, really doesn't tell you very much. And I know that there's quite a lot of, you know, around climate as well as in many uh, other experiences and situations that in one way are, are catastrophic and disastrous. You know, it doesn't really indicate whether, you know, in a psychological way people are traumatized or not. There's also a lot of complexity in terms of an event like a, an extreme weather event or, or these disasters and the kind of you know, people's personal backgrounds as well as their, what's available in, in their societies. I was thinking about this question. It's something that I've uh, felt very dubious about for, for quite a long time. And I was thinking about um, examples f from the psychoanalytic experiences, you know, with what appear to be traumatic situations. I was thinking about two that are, are quite relevant in terms of looking at the how these experiences are dealt with. One is, is quite early on was during World War II, during the London Blitz. Anna Freud and uh, several other child analysts set up war nurseries for children who had to, to leave London because of the, the tremendous danger, you know, of, of, of being bombed and so on. And what they did was they tried to maintain family groups and to encourage parents, particularly mothers, to visit these war nurseries, which were located outside of London, as frequently as possible. And that contrasts, for instance, very, very dramatically with the residential school system, which was the opposite. You know, it was taking children away from their, their society, their families. So you have to look at what are the mediators, the social and institutional ways that, that traumatic disasters can be dealt with. And another very interesting example is the work by a uh, psychoanalytic psychiatrist, James Gilligan, who was for a while the, the psychiatric director of the Massachusetts prison system, 
who wrote about these extraordinarily traumatized prisoners, incredible, horrible, you know, early childhood experiences and so on. And he reformed the prison system itself so that during his tenure there as as director for 10 years, there was not one incidence of violence, you know, no suicides, no rapes, no riots, no beatings and so on and so forth, no killing. So you have to look at the, you know, what the society provides. And, you know, in the United States now, the public infrastructure providing help has really so profoundly declined. So that's that's possibly one reason that people are feeling quite helpless, or some people are feeling quite helpless. But there are other instances, like during Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy, you know, when communities came together and helped each other. So, you know, there's many different ways that disasters can be dealt with. It's true, you know. I, I'm thinking of Katrina now. Some of the people there lost their homes, but more than their homes, they lost their community and their whole sense of roots, and they dispersed throughout the United States. They they went to Houston, and, and they went to Denver, and so on. But others, as you say, sort of gathered together and said, well, let's reimagine New Orleans. We're going to rebuild this place. And, and for them, it may have been more positive. I'd like to move on to something that an American professor, E. Ann Kaplan, she wrote a book in 2016 called Climate Trauma. And she was just looking at global warming and movies and literature And she talked about pre-traumatic stress syndrome, and this sort of clashed with the very little knowledge I have about Freud and and the early roots of psychoanalysis, because it seems to me in those roots, Freud was talking about events that had happened in the past and didn't really envision the possibility of future trauma. What are your thoughts on that? That's a very good question, because I think that he certainly wrote a, a lot and did respond to World War One. He, he actually lost a daughter in the ensuing flu uh, epidemic. So he and he did write a lot about war and the, the war and so on. So he was certainly you know aware of, of current um, trauma. But what he he did point out was that people's reactions are very so much influenced by their early experiences and how their early experiences can be reinterpreted at different developmental stages of uh, of life, as well as in the context of what they encounter in their society. You know, all these things have a very important bearing on how people experience disaster. And centrally in Freud, too, is how realistic they can be. Do their memories and their fears and their wishes impede their ability to understand what the reality is. We know some people are prone to depression for whatever reasons, and I'm wondering, do you think that people who are struggling with mental health issues should avoid finding out more about climate change until they feel better? Again, I think it depends on how it's dealt with, you know, and again, of course, it's one can ask them whether they feel ready to hear about things that are difficult. And also, it's, it's so important to be able to disconfirm what might be a, a belief that's, that's distorted, you know, by their proclivity to depression and hopelessness. From an analytic point of experience, you know, it could be very helpful to talk with people and to sort out, again, with them, hearing what their worries are when they're ready to talk about them, you know, what, what is realistic and not. And also what what they can do or what they would need, you know, not to feel so hopeless and helpless, too. Would you talk to us about your article, Convenient Untruths About Human Nature? How does that apply here? Okay. Well, one reason I wrote that is because I, um, when I was president of Science for Peace, and also I've been involved in these uh, kind of bad and other issues for for a while and, and have participated in many, many different kinds of organizations and groups and stuff. And what I I heard so often was that there were assumptions about people that were really incorrect, basically. Um, A lot of truisms, in a way, you know, about human nature and and, uh, 
uh, so often people, you know, spokespeople, very, very sharp people would generalize a lot about we, you know, we do this and, you know, humans do this and so on and so forth. And the effect of that was really to prevent a, a really thinking about what the problem was in the first place. Uh, in a way, it was I felt it was really diminishing of people to assume that you can choose what to tell people or not. You know, again, if, if something is difficult to hear, then you could listen to that and, and help people with it. But some of the truisms are, are so common now, you know, like talking about as if consumerism is a basic instinct, as if people can't have a, a, a realistic sense of time. They can't see too much in the future. They have to, they, they're living in the present. And, um, or that you can't ask people to give up anything. I think in a even much more insidious and concerning way is the prediction that people will will be violent, you know, in, in the face of particular hardships, like if, if they're deprived of water and food, you're going to see, or if they need to migrate, they'll storm borders, or they'll, they'll fight each other for the last scrap of food and water and that kind of thing. And historically, that's utterly inaccurate. And psychologically, it's also utterly inaccurate, too. So, you know, to describe people as, as if wars are inevitable, that violence and so on. And again, you know, there's so much historically that shows that there's innumerable ways that people have dealt with these things with each other. I guess, uh, you know, you're thinking about the Nobel Prize to um, Eleanor Ostrom, you know, who, who disputed the idea uh, that the commons were disastrous in themselves, the tragedy of the commons, that people will just use up their resources until everything is gone, you know, and that's not, that's not what happens. People over and over again organize themselves. Again, like, you know, like what happened in, in Katrina and Sandy. I was talking about the immediate reaction to those events, you know, when people really helped each other. They did. They brought boats from all over the country to go and try and rescue people, and they brought food and barbecues to get some meat going for those who eat it. Yeah. You're listening to EcoShock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. This is Radio Ecoshock. We're talking with Judy Deutsch about climate and mental health. Another thing I've been wondering about is whether there's any rational explanation for why so many climate scientists and other experts still say we have 12 years left to save a good climate, or, or we can still get 1.5 parts per million CO2 rise, when from everything that I'm reading and the scientists that talk to us that's no longer possible. So I wonder, are authorities trying to sell us false optimism, or are we demanding that optimism as part of every message that we get? I don't know. Well, you know, that's also just such a, a, a crucial thing to try to figure out and such a, a, an important question and observation. Because I, I fully agree with you, you know, that this idea of, of the 12 years and 1.5 degrees, I mean, it's going to be exceeded uh, certainly within a decade, you know, cause of, because of amplifying feedback, increasing rate of emissions and so on. But I don't think it's a scientist. I hear this in so many environmental groups and, you know, even the, the very sharp people, you know, um, like Naomi Klein and, and, and unfortunately, and, and, you know, the people in the Green New Deal and so on. I think that there's a lot of fun, some fundamental things about the climate systems that just are not uh, explained very clearly to people. I, I think there's a problem with uh, education, too, you know, the responsibility of of universities, but one thing that I, I, from a psychological angle that I think is at work, is what happens in, in groups, you know, that, that there is, um, I think, an unwillingness for various reasons, I'm sure, to challenge people who, who are in positions of authority, to question them. Uh, it's interesting, because James Hansen, in his book, On Terms of My Grandchildren, gave an example of that with... Um, when he was a young scientist, Richard Feynman, being the only one who could challenge um, Niels Bohr because, you know, he was young. He didn't have any big reputation to lose in a way. And Hansen has talked about, has written about the reticence of, of scientists 
But I, I think there's a huge problem, and I've observed it so many times, with people not not challenging people who are in, in, in authority, as if there's a, a culture, you know, of compliance. Well, we probably need that to some degree for society to function at all. I mean, if if everybody's an anarchist, it's very hard to put a society together. And it's ingrained to us in childhood. I mean, you do what your parents tell you. Well, it can be. I mean, there's been a lot of work on authoritarian versus non-authoritarian families and so on. But it's not it's not anarchism that I'm talking about. It's being it has to do with being informed and being able to question and to challenge on the basis of being informed, you know, of being able to discuss. It's interesting because uh, being able to discuss and argue is also, if I could mention a couple of philosophers, you know, is seen as being the most necessary and essential character of democracy. You know, I mean, Thucydides brought that up and, you know, and, and his work on the Peloponnesian War and, and then, you know, very very recently, Amartya Sen says that that's the, that discussion and arguing, being informed and so on, is, is the critical aspect of, of what makes a democracy a democracy, really. I just missed the name, the second name that you mentioned, the more recent uh, philosopher. Who who was that? It's Amartya Sen, S-E-N, and he wrote uh, a book called The um, Idea of Justice, which is very, very interesting. What he writes a lot about, it's about people being able to figure out with each other and talk with each other, even, you know, young children, uh, in a much more complex way about how to solve problems, you know. Now, along the ideas of justice, as far as I know, the UN Convention on Refugees and the subsequent international law still does not recognize climate refugees, and we know Donald Trump sure doesn't. So we know rising seas and extreme climate-driven events will set off the greatest mass migrations probably in human history. Do you think governments are waking up? Are we ready at all? Are we psychologically ready for what's coming in that regard? Well, again, this is so crucial and and horrible what the situation is. Right now there's, uh, what, 68 million displaced people, partly due to war, extreme poverty, uh, weather events, and so on. And you're exactly right. The U.N. does not protect uh, climate refugees, and that's that's terrible. I I think that the rightward swing of, of governments is going so much in the wrong direction, you know, in a very narrow nationalist, protectionist. I mean, at the end of the Cold War, I think there were 15 walled borders, and now there's 77, and the borders are militarized, so with, as we know, these awful detention centers. It seems to me that that this, again, requires a questioning and a dealing right now with the whole idea of borders. There's some excellent work on on just taking down borders. Personally, I think that that's critical. I mean, you can't have billions of people, you know, without any access to to migration, because there's going to be large parts of the world that are uninhabitable. You know, there's sea level rise, there's extreme temperatures. I, I think on one of your recent programs, maybe, people were talking about that at high temperatures, the wet bulb temperature is unlivable. You know, at, at 35 degrees wet bulb temperature, you know, people cannot survive, even in the shade, for more than six minutes, it's said. So. Well, and I, I think there's a growing public fear that mass deaths are in our future, even in this century, possibly. And, and we try to think that, well, people over there will be the ones to die, uh, not our relatively rich selves. There's the concept of disposable people, and there's the the problem of if we actually accept that a climate-driven holocaust is coming, what does that do to us from the psychoanalytic perspective? So oh, again, this is, uh, I think, related uh, from a psychoanalytic view. Uh, it has to do with, I think, what, what I would call a pathogenic belief. You know, the pathogenic belief being that, uh, that other people will take what what we have, will threaten our lives and so on and so forth. And it doesn't need to be that way at all, you know. And that, that means, for one, that we have to do everything we can right now 
to eliminate the threats to life, like eliminate fossil fuel emissions entirely and dismantle the military. I mean, that's, we can get into that. But, you know, how does one prepare for taking care of everybody? It's, you know, there's Naomi Klein and others talk about system change. Well, it has to be spelled out what that is going to look like so that everyone, everyone is able to survive. I know you had Mike Davis on the program recently, and and, and uh, he's a, a really brilliant historian who wrote this book about the late Victorian Holocaust, in which up to 50 million people died. But you know, we can get into that a little bit more. But one of the very fascinating things in the book was that he described a period in the 18th century in China where people were taken care of, you know, in, in these situations where there was the threat of mass death, that they had prepared for it. They provided the necessities of life. There's other other examples that people talk about now, like what happened to Cuba in the 1990s when they lost their entire economy, their fossil fuel-based economy, and had to radically transform their agricultural systems so that they could eat, so they could feed their people, you know. And this was done without the disasters that happened in the Soviet Union and in China and in India around around their very much failed agricultural transformations in which, you know, tens of millions of people died and so on. This, this is all avoidable, you know, if people work together and use the best of their knowledge in figuring out, you know, all these things are avoidable. You know, I'm thinking about, okay, how are we going to handle this? Uh, I feel there's a stress on myself covering this, and I get emails from listeners saying that they feel stressed about it, but there's not going to be enough trained mental health professionals to deal with a tsunami of upset people if the future is very disrupted. I talked with UK psychotherapist Rosemary or Ro Randall about her healing movement called Carbon Conversations, there's circles of people who meet to share their feelings about climate change. Do you think we can help ourselves, Judy, with local climate conversation or support groups? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's a very important thing there because, you know, a lot of people can be helpful. It's not just trained psychotherapists. In fact, often you know, trained people also do quite a lot of harm in in all these professions. But certainly, yeah, people can be very helpful to each other. Even in, in medicine, I, I recently met and read the book by uh, Gretchen Rohde. I think that's how you pronounce her name, but she's a physician who has worked for decades, you know, partly with uh, Medicine Sans Frontier, but other groups too, in horrible conditions around the world. And you know what paraprofessional people are now able to do? Like, you don't have to be a doctor now to, to do brain surgery, you know? I mean, there's, there's edible things that people can learn how to do. They're doing it. I mean, it's, it's already been, been used. And, you know, you have this whole whole tradition, too, of course, like with uh, nurse midwives, you know, being in charge of dealing with pregnancy and childbirth and so on. So you don't have to be uh, trained professionals for many, many years and so on to be helpful. I remember back in college, sort of Psychology 101, reading about a double bind theory. And I think that may apply to the situation we're in now because we know we're damaging the climate every day by driving cars by the way our food system works, everything, and yet we have to keep on doing it because we depend on that for our survival, we think. That sounds pretty familiar, too, to people with other damaging personal behaviors that they can't control. Should we be talking about carbon addiction, for example? I don't really think so. I, I, I think, But I think that things have changed in some ways for the worse in terms of, of that kind of personal awareness, you know, like, remember, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And, and, and then there were brief periods when people were, I, I guess, for instance, like in the 70s and the oil embargo, you know, that people, of course, knew that they had to carpool or to drive at lower speed limits, you know. The, so there have been many times when people have very willingly, you know, cut down but now I, I I think that there's just for some reason there's and I do think it has to do with the irresponsibility 
of people who are in positions of of influence. And I hear, you know, include, you know, people in city councils and, and universities and so on and so forth. They've reneged on their responsibility. I go to the gym at the University of Toronto, and I see everyone, you know, pushing buttons to instead of walking through a turnstile, you know, to get into the gym. And it's, it's not like that. That's going to omit very much, but it's as if nothing is on their mind, you know, about using excess electrical energy, you know, um, or for a brief time. Plastic bags cost a few cents, so nobody used plastic bags. And then somehow that got overturned, and so everybody's using plastic bags. It's very bizarre, but I, I feel concerned that when the solutions that are proffered are so out of sync with the, uh, the magnitude of the problem that it, it, it creates a lot of doubt and skepticism in people about how serious the problem really is. And and that's been the case all along, you know, that the proffered solutions have been so disproportionate to what the problem is. Um, Certainly there there are efforts to address aspects of it, like there's a free public transit uh, movement here in Toronto, but there has to be so much more of that. It's so easy to sidetrack what the full, uh, what the full picture is. You know, and in terms of ignorance, in 2000, I think it was 2009, it was before the Copenhagen meetings, it was when I was president of Science for Peace, we were fortunate enough to have James Hansen come and talk. We, we did it in collaboration with the Center for Global Change Science, and we brought together for the first time um, uh, James Hansen, Naomi Klein, and Clayton Thomas Muller from the uh, Indigenous Environmental Network. He's a Tar Sands campaigner. So we were what what I was wanting to do was to bring together these intersecting aspects having to do with climate change and climate justice, and you know the system, the capitalist system too. So James Hansen had just written his book, and it was just published, The Stormers of My Grandchildren, which, to my mind, it's a fascinating book, and I think it's an essential book. Um, he, I mean, he's such a brilliant scientist, and I think demonstrates what scientific thinking, like his, his way of questioning and observing things in the physical world. I don't think he's very good in terms of uh, politics, but his scientific work is so important. And, and um, anyway, the University of Toronto is, has, uh, I think, one of the largest university libraries in North America. So I noticed it took quite a long time for them to even get one copy of his book. Now, after 10 years, there's only two copies of his book in the entire University of Toronto system, whereas there's multiple copies of of other people like uh, you know who are essentially climate skeptics or they befuddle the whole thing like Bjorn Lomborg so you know he'll have ten to twenty copies in the library with James Hansen only there's only two so uh, I I taught a class there for a couple of years on climate justice and the students told me, you know, that it was hardly ever talked about. This is a subject that should be, that all departments, all departments should be working on it, and you know, and, and working together. It's hard to understand. Well, there's a cartoon, and it, it shows a, a movie theater that's showing two movies, and on one side is Climate Truth and Nobody's There, and the other side is Climate Lies, and there's a big lineup to buy tickets. So... <laughs> And I get, I think that's partly to ease our own consciousness and, and conscience about what we're doing, because once we know, we do feel bad that we're out there filling up our gas tank again, and we know what's going to happen, and it's not going to be good for our kids and our grandkids, and both of us have those. So I think that we're looking for some comfort in the lies. I'm sure that that's true. I think it was interesting because in, in the class that I taught, the students talked about it, and they they said that uh, you know it's more of a, like a cultural an aspect. There's an aspect of cultural style. They said that in their social groups, you're not supposed to talk about anything that's stressful. You know, 
but however, if you do something, you know, like if you, uh, then you'll then you'll be imitated and copied. But you're not supposed to talk about it. Like they they implemented recycling and and composting and all that kind of stuff, and then everybody did it, but they weren't willing to talk about it. So this is a, a particular culture among amongst these. Uh, students and you know, and an educated and affluent aspect, <laughs> the, the little group. But it's hard to know. It's, it's, a couple of years ago, I was in Guatemala too, as part of a, a health delegation to look at the impact of mining on the people. And there were people from Guatemala, Panama, southern part of Mexico, and and I mean, they were just completely straightforward and forthcoming about what was going on and its uh, psychological and and, uh, social impact, you know, young people, too. And they were talked about climate change. So, you know, again, it's hard to make generalizations about why and how these things happen. But from an analytic point of view, psychoanalytic, you know, really, I think... Quite central, and Freud was uh, was he was addressing the capacity to deal with reality, to perceive reality, to to act in accordance with reality. And there's the inside reality, the psychological world, and then there's the outside. And what he helps people with is to disentangle again their fears and their wishes from what the realities are. And what you do is you help people, you know, if, if it feels like it's too overwhelming, then, then you can talk with them about what aspect is overwhelming and what can be, what can be done. Maybe it is too overwhelming and there's nothing, but, but often there is. In any groups, there are people who are able to, to think through and, and try to figure out what to do. You know, like you're talking about, about buying and, and cars and all that kind of stuff. So then, like, these are things that have to change. They just have to change. And so you say, how, how can we do that? What's the best way that we can do that? What are the different possibilities rather than avoiding the whole thing altogether? Well, two of my best friends bought electric cars, and those electric cars are running off uh, hydropower. So they're trying to take a step, and it cost them some bucks to do it, but they think it's worth it. Now, another thing that I've seen you talk about is distortions in sense of time and how that might affect climate thinking. Could you talk to us about that? Well, I guess one of the things that comes up often, you know, in in uh, discussions about what to do in a- activist groups and so on and so forth, is the assumption that people can't think beyond the present, you know, and that actions have to be, have an immediate effect, like this doing something right now, this assumption that people can't think into the future, which, again, you know, is just historically untrue. I mean, the example is given, like, in Mike Davidson's book about, uh, you know, the way people were completely prepared for, in China in the 18th century, for these uh, these um, drought disasters. But the uh, ability to, you know, to have a realistic sense of time is really quite fascinating. You know, like very, very young children don't have that. You know, they they don't understand the duration and the passage of time. But as they mature, they're able to know that, although it's, again, it's uh, infinished upon by wishes and fears, so that if you want the school day to end and you're very bored, time seems very, very long and so on and so forth. But by the time one is an adult or, you know, even an adolescent, you can have a very realistic sense of time that goes beyond your own personal experience. So talking about what's going to happen 50, 100 years, 200 years from now, it can really be comprehended and, and needs to be comprehended. Absolutely. I mean, we're learning now for the first time the long history of Earth and the different climates that have been here on Earth. and. We are looking at what will happen over the next thousand years or so, and and we have to, as a society, be prepared to think along those lines. And there have been a couple in the past that did try and think those long-term views. China is one. Uh, the Romans, to a certain degree, gave it a shot. I think part of the problem there is, too, that we are always looking for a simple photograph when actually time is, is flowing and much more complex than that. And 
Something that you said in an email really sparked me for some reason. I'd like you to talk about your statement that psychoanalytic psychology reveals a system. What do you mean? Uh, okay, that is that is also, I think, really crucial. Because climate is often presented not as a system, and uh, the ecosystem is also not presented as a system. And it's, it, it, so it minimizes... It distorts the uh, magnitude and gravity, you know, of the current situation, so that the image of the polar bear in no way indicates uh, the intricate interrelationships and the disasters of of the ecosystem collapse, Um, and that it's much more crucial, for instance, to look at phytoplankton than polar bears. In terms of the climate, you know, when it's presented as the only information is the uh, global average surface temperature or, or as you say, like 12 years from now without any comprehension of the, the interweaving effects of, of uh, the amplifying feedbacks and the interweaving effects between the physical and the biological worlds, that these are, are interacting systems Something like uh, you know, you know, we hear stories about the ice sheet melt and the rising seas, but there's no uh, no uh, understanding or reporting about how that affects the stratification of the ocean and the you know the provision of, of nutrients within the ocean and, and the difference between the effects of heating and and uh, carbon dioxide absorption. You know, it's like so simplistic that that it's not. Uh, it's, a, it's an utter distortion, like this carbon budget that was formulated by William Nordhaus. He's the one who got the Nobel Economics Prize, um, and he came up with the the carbon budget that seems to have been adopted by the uh, COP meetings, the UN framework meetings. It seems to be based on a linear, non-system model, you know, as if you add two parts per million this year and then... It's just going to say two parts per million, <laughs> you know, and that is, it's a strange thing again when the people who who know or who ought to know, like the scientists or people in uh, academia, are not not correcting this. They're not being public about how this is so erroneous. Well, you've triggered another problem that I've been sort of working on for a while, which is. I have to tell a little story here, but uh, it has to do with the the German philosopher uh, Martin Heidegger. And back in the 20s and 30s, uh, and and before, he he was just a brilliant man. He came up with a lot of existential philosophy uh, as a source of that. But he was also totally blind to so many things and, and singled out and selected other Jewish professors in his university to be uh, separated out and, and eventually probably sent to their deaths. He was also a naturalist. He believed that the Rhine River should not be damned because uh, the river has its own rights, so we have to agree with them there. And, and my point is that some very brilliant people who actually can contribute something to human knowledge can also be twisted and, and blind within themselves and mislead us about human knowledge at the same time. And that's the conundrum, I think, that we face in many cases. I so much agree with you. Yeah, and again, I think people need to be encouraged and permitted to think. (laughs) You know, in a way, this was what what Nuremberg was about, you know, is that people are are individuals, individuals responsible for... um, What I say is challenging authority. I actually had worked with somebody... Because of confidentiality, I can't give many details, but it was a person who grew up in post-war, right after, you know, the, the, the war in, in Germany, and told me, you know, this is a period of denazification, and told me that as part of the school system, with young children, and, and I, uh, I, I've see, seen this in a school, a very, a very fine school in the States, too, but not only did they uh, teach about personal responsibility, but they also said that people um, really needed to challenge authority. You know that that was that was actually taught. It's just so important, you know, that you 
you don't have to be brilliant. You don't have to even be well educated. You can, and I, you see this with children, is that they can ask amazing questions. Yes, and that, that was a bumper sticker in the '60s. Challenge authority. We got to bring it back. Obviously, Judith Deutsch, as a peace activist, you've been writing about the dangers of nuclear weapons and militarization for decades. And in the last ten years, as far as I know, you've also added new warnings about climate militarization. What is that? What is that? It's it's on my mind because I'm actually writing a little uh, a pamphlet about it right now. This is uh, this is very interesting. Um, about ten years ago, after the right after the Copenhagen meetings, a peace activist Sarah Flounders wrote a very incredibly important, insightful article. She was in Copenhagen, and she said, "You know, with a hundred thousand people in the streets and delegates from you know from all the countries and so on and so forth, and all the NGOs, that no one brought up the Kyoto exemption of the military." which was, is and was at that time, too, the largest single emitter of, of greenhouse gases. And it is still exempt. And the military figures into climate change in so many ways. You know, for one, there's the direct and enormous emissions, uh, you know, on the battlefield, just from the, the uh, F-15s and F-16s and so on, the Apaches. The, the battleships and so on, which all use the dirtiest forms of fossil fuels, you know, jet fuel and bunker fuel. So there's those emissions. There's the um, emissions from the destruction of carbon sinks, you know, the enormous deforestation um, in uh, Korea, in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and the destruction of the soil in, in the uh, Gulf Wars and so on. So the military is destroying, you know, the, the sinks. There's, they've, you know, they militarize uh, the borders now at this point, and they've also been um, taken on. This is the, the U.S. military and NATO. They've taken on the role of, uh, of providing security, a securitization of climate change, which is, is framing climate again in terms of, you know, uh, it's a, they call it a, um, a threat multiplier. A threat multiplier in which the violence is attributed to the victims, you know, that we have to protect against the hordes and so on. And there's the uncounted externalities, the life cycle analysis of of uh, the production of all its uh, equipment and transportation and military bases. So it's enormous, and it's just not, it hasn't been part of any proposals for how to deal with the rapidly accelerating greenhouse gas emissions. Very recently, I would say maybe even, uh, maybe it's combined because of the nuclear weapons threat, but a couple of people are addressing it, and, and they all happen to be mainly women. It's not just this year, but uh, there's, uh, I can send you uh, the, the names and the links to articles that they've written. But most recently, it was actually brought up by um, Medea Benjamin, you know, who's a, an incredible uh, anti-war person, together with Alice Slater, who has been on the anti-nuclear weapons issue for many years. So they've, they've just started to talk about this. There's a person in Canada who is also working on this. Her name is Tamara Lorink. So she's doing a lot of work on the, uh, pretty much on the huge discrepancy in government allocations, like for military versus environmental spending. But she also deals to some extent with the direct emissions from, from the military. This is a whole world, the military, that the, the climate people and the environmental people seem to have put it out of, out of perception. <laughs> you know, if you read anything about, about the military world, and the extent of militarization and, you know, in, in space and nuclear weapons. Obama, you know, allocated over a trillion dollars for modernization of nuclear weapons. And so this is a whole other world that seems to be invisible to, to the people who think that they're going to, you know, have a nice, renewable energy future, <laughs> you know. Also, the other thing is that renewables aren't going to affect any aspect, pretty much, of the military. You know, the whole technology, like the, you know, aviation and shipping, it will be dependent on fossil fuels, possibly remotely biofuels, which are incredibly destructive, you know, for decades to come.
America just dumped a missile treaty and the Iran nuclear deal, and Russia has announced a new series of terrible nuclear weapons, including something that will make a tsunami that could sweep over New England or something. And we thought that was over. And we're spending on super death weapons just at the very time we need every dollar and resource to convert to renewables, to capture carbon, to prepare for extreme weather and and rising seas. And the fact that this is happening makes me wonder if there is a collective unconscious and if we are expressing a desire for mass suicide, uh, what Wilhelm Reich called a will to death. Yeah, you know, I can't see that in terms of the human population. I mean, there's so many remarkable examples of the will to live and to work together to um, create societies that, that can endure and to fight against this, this horrible thing. You know, how much is spent on trying to sell the military and trying to sell wars? You know, it's not something that one can say there's just a drive for it. You know, there's so many lies and, and fomenting fears and, and manipulation and, you know, horrible things that, and punishments for people who oppose war and so on. You know, and you look at the awful ways, you know, in, in other countries, you know, like child soldiers, uh, how they're induced to fight and so on. I don't think there's a will to suicide. I don't think so. I think that the people who, you know, who are involved in this are very horrible people, though. <laughs> and um, I, I think that has to be seen and acknowledged, you know, that they're, they're people with severe deficits in their capacity to comprehend the human world. And know? to feel for other people, the empathy. But I, I think there's two currents running. There, There is that current uh, possibility of evil, but there is also the current we can tap into, which, as you say, is a very strong will to live, is a very strong joy in living, and that's where we hope the majority of us will go, and that will be, let's say, the winning side. And as we wrap up here, Judy, do you have people or places beyond what you've already mentioned? You've mentioned some great stuff to recommend for our listeners who want to learn more about how to cope with climate change and and what it will mean in our lives. I don't know, because the way, uh, you know, people have their different ways, you know, of coping with things, uh, you know, what what they're looking for, what they need, you know, I mean, music literature and so on, um, you know, experiencing nature. But I, I think I think it's really important to something that's uh, maybe uh, overlooked and underestimated is, is it's so important to be able to talk with each other, you know, and to realize that people have to talk with each other and to figure things out together, you know, and to overcome their immediate day-to-day conflicts with each other and work together, you know, for the the common good and to get help, to get help from from people who should be providing the help and so on and so forth. Um, I must say that, um, you know, I think there's some extraordinarily good uh, histories all of a sudden that have appeared very recently for people who are who want more of the intellectual theoretical underpinnings too, which isn't necessary, but some people might. But I, I would recommend um, three people in particular. I mean, sh- uh, there's certainly more. Well, I, I had mentioned you know the Mike Davis book, the Late Victorian Holocaust, is very important. But also Andreas Malm, M A L M, is very is excellent, and Jason Moore, and um, there's two French. People who've written a book together that's uh, really superb. Um, it's called The Shock of the Anthropocene by uh, uh, Benoit and Fresso. It's published by Verso. And um, these are just excellent, very, very carefully researched histories that really uh, disprove many uh, and disconfirm many of the uh, assumptions that uh, that I think I have been p- paralyzing in terms of trying to figure out what to do. And of course, as a psychoanalyst, it's always important to go back and investigate our past. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so look, the shock of the Anthropocene, and this is Radio Ecoshock, as it turns out, and I'm going to put links to 
pretty well everything we've talked about and some more helpful links in my show blog at ecoshock.org. I want to mention things like Climate Psychology Alliance.org, which has got a whole bunch of things going on. There's speakers coming up in London with Jem Bendel and Ro Randall in April 2019. That sort of thing you can find out. I'll put it in my blog. Check that out for sure. Finding out more may be good for your mental health. From Toronto, Canada, we've been talking with practicing psychoanalyst, journalist, and activist Judy Deutsch. Judy, I appreciate the tips you've given me in our email discussions, and I'm glad we finally met on radio. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm Alex Smith for Radio EcoShock. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org.